I'm delighted to welcome Professor Graham Hatfall from the University of Pittsburgh, who wins the 2020 Peter Wilde Prize, which is awarded to an individual for an outstanding contribution to microbiology education and communication in order to stimulate interest and understanding in the subject. Professor Hartful is a world leading expert in collecting phage and learning what they do. And is also developing an understanding of the potentials of phage therapy, where phage can be used to actually control pathogenic bacteria. At the moment, his research focuses on the molecular genetics of mycobacteria and their phage. And these studies take advantage of the intimacy of the phage host interaction and allows us to gain insight into the genetics and physiology of mycobacterium tuberculosis, obviously the causative agent of human TB. Through integrated research education programs, such as FIRE and CFAGE programs, a large collection of completely sequenced mycobacteriophage genomes provides insight into viral diversity and evolution and represents a rich toolbox of new approaches for understanding mycobacterium tuberculosis and other mycobacterial diseases. Today, his lecture is intriguingly entitled, Who Wouldn't Want to Discover a New Virus? So let's listen carefully and see whether we do want to discover a new virus. Hello, my name is Graham Hatful, and I'm delighted to present the Peter Wilde lecture, Who Wouldn't Want to Discover a New Virus? It's a great pleasure to be um, to receiving this great honor and, and the opportunity to tell you about some of our work in, in science education and science communication in recognition of Peter Wilde. Um, our paths never crossed, um, unfortunately, Although he was president of SGM while I was a graduate student from 1978 to 81, and I remember very uh, uh, me many memorable uh, SGM meetings that I went to as a student, and uh, and uh, I, I'm sure that uh, Dr. Wilde would have been there, and I'm sad that we never actually got the chat. There are many challenges in science education, but among them is the notion of how students get engaged in research and who has the opportunity, opportunity to do this. A fairly common uh, model is the so-called apprentice model, where a student works in a research lab working on a research project under the supervision of either a faculty member, a professor, another graduate student, or, or, or a postdoc in the lab. Um, and this is a good model, uh, and there are enormous benefits for the student to be able to do this, um, but it has its limitations as well, especially because um, it usually involves some selection as to who is going to have access to this opportunity. And the selection is often made on academic performance um, in the classroom because there's not much else to go on. Um, and uh, there's relatively few research opportunities. Uh, there's many more students who might be interested in doing this than there are research labs and mentors that could be provided. And this selection then helps to, um, I think, constrain diversity of the scientific community and exclude students who might otherwise have a wonderful aptitude for doing research, but don't get selected because of the, the criteria uh, that are used. And so finding solutions to this, I think, are helpful and important, um, but, but are relatively uncommon. So uh, this uh, just illustrates um, the, the more traditional, and then, and then what I'm going to propose is different ways of thinking about this issue. So in, in the traditional system, as I said, uh, students work as apprentices in a research lab, usually towards the latter part of their undergraduate careers in the US system, where there is be, typically will be a four year education. Uh, those students are doing it as a junior or a senior and are often destined to head off to graduate school or medical school. And then the selection to who gets to do it is often based on their academic performance in their early years in the, uh, uh, in the uh, undergraduates. An alternative model, though, is where uh, students can engage in research early on in their first year in college, 
Um, this may be done as a course-based research experience, and so students are doing research as part of a course, accommodating many students, and perhaps all students within a particular program in biology, for example, and the students can participate essentially without pre-selection. And by placing this early in the undergraduate curriculum, um, it provides an abundance of opportunities for students to engage in other activities, including research experiences, which build upon that later on in their uh, graduate careers, including uh, apprenticeships. Um, and this can benefit um, not just those students going on to graduate school and medical school, but whatever their career choices may be, where it would be really helpful to know something about how science is done and the process of scientific discovery. The structure that I'd like to propose um, in order to be able to accomplish this at relatively large scale is what uh, we would refer to as an inclusive research education community or an IREC. Um, so we would think about this as a common infrastructure that supports many different types of institutions from um, research active institutions to those such as community colleges that don't have a robust research infrastructure um, to include many different types of faculty, uh, regardless of what their training and expertise is. Inclusion of all types of students, regardless of their academic and demographic uh, backgrounds with the idea of uh, promoting a more diverse scientific community. The research component of the IREC um, can depend on what one defines as research. Uh, there's many different ways of doing so, not surprisingly perhaps, but we would think of it as involving scientific discovery, learning new things, um, having publishable information, uh, and that it is um, studying something which is generally important uh, to the scientific community at large. I'm going to tell you about the uh, CFAGES program specifically, which is a good example of uh, an IREC. And this diagram just illustrates the, 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 the structure of the IREC. So showing down here is the nuts and bolts of what individual students are actually doing in terms of their work. We'll look at this in a bit more detail in a minute. But this is happening in a structure here where there is a programmatic leadership. So here's the people that are doing the leadership here. And then this is a whole series of support functions that are provided programmatically, uh, which include things like um, uh, training workshops, um, uh, scientific uh, details and leadership and questions, assessment databases, um, uh, and various other other tools, and then community building structures, like faculty retreats, symposia, etc. So it's a plug and play model, essentially, where a common programmatic uh, structure is provided, uh, and then individual institutions can choose to participate, essentially in a plug and play type of process, um, where they can they can enter into the community, and they don't have to provide all of this stuff themselves to Novo, they can use this in order to rapidly uh, implement these programs to the benefit of the students. CFAGES uh, is an acronym, but it's got nothing to do with the oceans. Uh, the, the C, the SEA is an is a acronym for the Science Education Alliance, which is a particular uh, program and office, if you like, at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute who have provided direct and indirect support for this program. And then phages is an acronym for phage hunters advancing genomics and evolutionary science. And so this is a program that's focused on bacteriophage discovery and genomics with a goal of elucidating the diversity and evolution of the phage population. So um, why is phage discovery um, well suited to the development of this type of IREC? Well, what we've learned in the past few years about the phage population is that it's huge. There's 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 7 phage particles per mil of water, pretty much wherever you look on the planet, um, which means there's an estimated 10 to the power of 31 total phage particles in the biosphere, um, about tenfold more than the number of bacteria. 
And so the population is not only large, but it's, uh, it's dynamic. There's an estimated to be 10 to the power of 23 phage infections per second on a global scale with the entire phage population effectively replacing itself every few days. And the population is likely very old. This has been going on for a very long time. Um, and these parameters, not surprisingly, have generated an incredibly diverse and variable uh, population of phages, genet genetically variable and diverse with lots of different genomes and lots of different genes. And defining that diversity is a key question for the C-phages program. If you want to uh, understand um, phage diversity, there's at least two really good ways of doing it. One is a metagenomic approach where you take uh, a sample containing lots of viruses, uh, you concentrate the, the viruses, extract the nucleic acids, and sequence it as deeply as you can possibly do, um, and, uh, and can do this with different samples at different times, for example, and can learn enormous amount about viral diversity and evolution. And it gives you an enormous amount of information that sits on your hard drive and your computer. The second approach is we would think of it as a phage by phage or a genome by genome approach where individual phages are isolated from the environment. Uh, given their diversity, there's, uh, there's lots of different ones. And so it's rare to find exactly the same virus twice. Uh, so this is perfect for a student discovery that students can isolate phages one at a time. The genomes can be sequenced and characterized. And this provides less of the information that gets stored in your databases and your computers but it also gives you things that you can store in the freezer. It gives you the isolates. Um, you can archive, archive them. They can be grown, propagated, manipulated, mutated, uh, genetically analyzed, and, and potentially uh, used uh, in, in a variety of clinically uh, useful ways. Like all viruses, phages are specific for the bacterial hosts that they infect and grow on. And so if you want to isolate individual phages, which is what happens in the C phages program, you need to choose a particular bacterial host to do that with. Um, we have focused in the C phages program on hosts in the phylum uh, actinobacteria um, with a principal focus on Mycobacterium smegmatis, a non-pathogenic, relatively fast growing relative of pathogens, Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium uh, abscessus. But about a dozen or so different bacterial hosts have been used um, for phage isolation and characterization. This just illustrates really what the students are doing in the C phages program. Uh, they, they, they enter the university and start pretty much straight away. Uh, they collect a sample from wherever students like to go and pick stuff and put it in a tube, but soil and compost, et cetera, is relatively common. Then this is uh, with a simple extraction is mixed with the bacteria of choice. In this case, I'm showing you Mycobacterium smegmatis. That is then plated out on a solid uh, medium, on solid agar. And then you can see individual plaques of each one rep represents uh, an area of infection deriving from a single phage particle. This is then uh, goes through several rounds of purification and amplification can grow relatively large amounts uh, of the individual phage that has been isolated. The student gets to name that phage. Um, they then can look at it by electron microscopy, purify the nucleic acids. Uh, the DNA is sequenced, uh, and then they do the bioinf bioinformatic aspects of genome annotation sequence comparison. And hopefully we'll learn and discover some things that will eventually lead to publications. This is typically implemented as a two term course. Students are doing about four hours lab work a week. Um, and the first term, usually the fall term is the microbiology focus, the phage discovery um, uh, aspect, uh, identification, purification, amplification, isolation of DNA, et cetera. Genomes are sequenced between the two terms. And then in the second term, uh, is really the bioinformatic and computational approaches uh, of the particular genomes, the phages uh, uh, that students have isolated. This, uh, essentially this platform has been implemented in several different uh, kinds of programs. 
We, it was initially uh, developed in the FIRE program, which was a local program to Pittsburgh here, but then subsequently in the CFAGES program. And the CFAGES program has now grown from uh, its uh, start in 2008 um, to have over 150 participating institutions and about 5,500 students a year uh, currently. It's important to have ways to uh, assemble and share the data that's generated um, by this disseminated community uh, in the CFAGES program. And so we have a database called the Actinobacteriophage Database and a website at phagesdb.org um, where students can enter data and can access and share data. Um, I would just note a couple of points here on the left is just uh, indicating some uh, this is a, a, a shot, a uh, screenshot from the from the website. You can see some of the names that students have used to um, uh, creatively name the phages that they've isolated. We use a non-systematic naming system, which essentially reflects the individualistic nature of the genomes when you analyze them. We've um, isolated collectively um, about 18,700 or so phages in total, all ar archived in Pittsburgh. So a pretty uh, impressive collection in terms of phages. They haven't all been sequenced, but about 3,700 have been completely sequenced and annotated, most of which have been deposited in the uh, public databases. And we have a second uh, database at cphages.org, um, which really provides all of the programmatic details, uh, the member institutions, the faculty, the students, the numbers of different types of sections and courses that are being offered, uh, and resources so that uh, uh, students uh, and faculty can, uh, can access uh, uh, that and information about the program. So the program has been, I think, productive in terms of both the advancements in science and in terms of the student education. So um, I'd like to just illustrate those. So first, if we just look at the number of sequenced actinobacteriophage genomes over the years, um, uh, we sequenced the first genome uh, back here in 1993. Uh, it was a huge amount of work at the time. Um, uh, and now barely represents a blip on this curve, but it's a rather magnificent curve nonetheless. And you can see that as these uh, programs were introduced, first the FIRE program, and then more substantially the CFAGES program in terms of size, you see this really impressive increase in the number of genomes that have been sequenced. Of course, this is uh, influenced and facilitated by the uh, simplicity of the newer sequencing methodologies uh, and the reduced costs. But it doesn't matter how simple or cheap the sequencing is if you don't have the isolates uh, to characterize in the first place. So these programs have really coupled uh, the power of the phage isolation with the power of the genomics uh, as it has developed. Um, the program has grown uh, and proven sustainable to date after uh, its introduction in 2008. More and more institutions and students have been added each year, which is then reflected in the increase in the total number of phages and sequence phages that have been isolated. Um, we have indeed been able to incorporate different types of institutions, both with and without uh, active research uh, infrastructures, uh, and a number of publications and citations have emerged. We've also looked at the impact on student and students' intent to continue and to persist in their studying of the sciences. This has been a longstanding problem um, with many students, especially in the US, that start and join college in studying science, drop out and do something else before they've graduated. And so the education systems have done a pretty poor job of really encouraging them to stay uh, in these areas of sciences and to work and to graduate there. Um, and so um, we've analyzed this using, using a, a broadly used surveys with large numbers of survey responses. Um, we've then compared this to students in a more traditional uh, type of lab that's an introductory lab that does not involve research. And so the CFAGES um, students are shown in blue and the traditional students are shown in yellow here. 
Uh, this is just an overall comparison sh showing um, substantial uh, uh, gains essentially in this parameter by students in the CFAGES program. And, uh, and you can break it down to all sorts of different uh, subgroups here of underrepresented uh, groups, or minorities, uh, first generation students. And uh, I think you can see that these gains are enjoyed broadly um, in a fully inclusive type of way, as we had hoped. And that intent to continue in the sciences uh, it is actually borne out by data that suggests in the red here that students do indeed actually uh, continue to take more science courses uh, following the CFAGES experience as opposed to a traditional course shown in blue. What have we learned about um, actinobacteriophages and about viral diversity? I'd like to mention a few, a few aspects of it. Um, first, that um, the diversity is complex. Um, we can find phages that appear to have closely related genome sequences, uh, relatively speaking. And so we'll put those together in what we call a cluster. So a cluster is a group of closely related, relatively closely related phages. Some of those can be divided into subclusters. And then we have genomes that are singletons, one of a kind that we don't have any close relatives. And so I'll just illustrate this, first of all, for the mycobacteria um, that you can see that, that there's 29 clusters, 10 singletons, um, and, a, and a pretty large number of these different groups, if you like. And overall, with all of the different, about a dozen different hosts, lots of clusters, um, meaning types of phages that are completely different to each other, uh, if, if you like, uh, and, and singletons, um, reflecting overall uh, substantial diversity. Uh, this is just looking at, at, at illustrations of the mycobacteriophage clusters. So this is the largest collection of phages, about 2,000 sequence phages isolated on Mycobacterium smegmatis uh, specifically. Um, and um, we would just say these are all double-stranded DNA tailed phages. Their genomes vary between about 40,000 bases and 160,000 bases. Uh, and at least half of these different types are actually temperate. So temperate phages are, are, are common uh, members of this particular type of phages. If we just do a gene content um, network phylogeny, uh, this is just essentially comparing one of each type. Uh, you can see, I think they're very uh, impressive diversity as these principally diverge from a central region indicating that pairwise, they actually share really few uh, genes uh, uh, with each other when this particular subset is analyzed. So that gives a sense of how genomes in different clusters are related to each other, but even genomes within a cluster can be highly variable. And I'm showing you an example here of a set of genomes within a particular cluster. It happens to be cluster N. Um, each of the genomes is shown as a ruler with these colored boxes representing the genes. Um, this is meant to be a 10,000 uh, foot view of this. And so you don't need to worry about the particular individual genes, but the coloring in between uh, genomes displayed pairwise, this coloring here is a, ref is a reflection of the nucleotide sequence similarity shared between those. So you can see that all of these genomes are very closely related at the DNA sequence level, and of course, at the protein level as well, for this set of genes in the left parts of these genomes. But then when you look elsewhere in the genome, in these right parts, you can see it is highly variable with segments of closely related sequence interspersed with regions uh, that are distantly related. Enormous diversity. Where does this diversity come from? Um, we learn, we, we know, I think, that some of that diversity comes from and is a reflection of this uh, the constant battle, the endless struggle between phages and their bacterial hosts, where bacteriophages are constantly attacking the host and killing the host. The host has a strong pressure to survive and therefore has systems 
that defend it from that kind of attack. And there's a multitude of these. It includes restriction and CRISPR, Board of Infection Systems, and many others um, that are found as defense systems encoded in, uh, in, the, in the bacterial genomes. But we now know that the phages themselves, temperate phages forming prophages, I'm showing an integrated prophage in this genome, that these two can encode their own sets of defense systems that defend against both itself uh, and against other related phages. And so these uh, phages that students are isolating are rich with these types of, uh, of, of components of the dynamics. My point is, is that each of these can be pursued by students uh, experimentally. And I'm just illustrating here the fact that you can demonstrate, for example, that if we compare this host strain here of Mycobacterium smegmatis with a lysogen. So now this is a strain of smegmatis carrying this particular prophage, that this now confers defense by the attack of these other phages. And this is microbiologically simple to, uh, to show. These lysogens can be constructed, uh, they can be grown, and these simple plaque assays can be used and you can see these patterns of defense where a phage uh, fails to efficiently infect the strain. You can make mutants and identify genes that are responsible for the defense and in fact you can isolate escape mutants of the attacking phages that now are able to overcome that defense. So this is all experimentally tractable uh, and students can use this to identify, as an example, new defense mechanisms and ways in which phages can counter those defense mechanisms. And this is just a, an illustration of that one example I showed you, where it appears as though this particular phage called FRAN uh, encodes a new defense system uh, which manipulates uh, the levels of PPGPP uh, in order to defend against phage attack. And then finally, um, we believe that these phages are useful for lots of applications and translations beyond simply the discovery of phages and the exploration of their dynamics. Uh, and I would just uh, uh, indicate this particular report here. This is all that I'll show is the paper published a couple of years ago, which showed how these bacteriophages isolated by CFAGES students could be used to treat a patient uh, in London who had a disseminated uh, infection with a drug-resistant Mycobacterium abscessus strain. This is the first example of the therapeutic use of uh, phages to treat a mycobacterial infection um, and uh, illustrates um, what, can, what can emerge from these types of, uh, of, of integrated research education programs. This is obviously important for the, for the patient that was treated. It's important for the community that is interested in, in, in new ways of treating antibiotic resistant uh, infections. But it's important for students in the CFAGES program as well. Only three phages were used in this particular treatment, not the many thousands that we have isolated. But the point is that when a student, or if you were to go and isolate a new phage from the environment, you don't know whether that is going to be a useful one therapeutically or not. And so it is useful to isolate it, study it, characterize it, name it, uh, contribute to the overall collection. And you never know, yours might be the phage that's the critical one uh, in, in treating a patient or leading to uh, perhaps even more uh, a broader type of new medicine uh, that could prove useful uh, in the treatment of these types of infections. So in summary, C CFAGES is an inclusive research education uh, community. And the integration of the research and the education uh, mi uh, missions really promotes sustainable successes in both. So students gain 
uh, from doing this, but those uh, stu the student engagement um, promotes the research advancement and the research gains essentially to help to justify and to illustrate the, um, the, the, the importance uh, of doing this work. Uh, it's a program, uh, bacteriophage discovery in genomics, that's well suited uh, for student engagement. There may be many other types of research projects that are equally well suited to this large scale uh, uh, program. But I think that dis phage discovery in genomics is, is perhaps uh, one of the best. Uh, there's many, many more phages to be isolated and discovered, and there are many more phages than are, there are students. So there really is an endless supply of novelty to be, um, to be understood. And then C-phages address, addresses uh, these basic questions about phage population, um, uh, but it's really helpful as well and promotes uh, the, the, the utility of phages in various biotechnological applications including the therapeutic interventions. I'd like to finish by thanking the many, many participants uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this program and these discoveries, especially my colleagues here uh, listed uh, here uh, at HHMI who have helped to develop and to deliver these programs. Um, and uh, I'll just say uh, uh, thank you to all here and thank you to listening to uh, the recording of this talk, and I look forward to being able to answer uh, any questions. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Tim Blower. I'm up at Durham University in the UK, and it's my pleasure to host this live question and answer session. So let me first introduce and welcome um, the Peter Wildey Prize winner for 2020, Professor Graham Hatful. Welcome, Graham, and congratulations, of course. Tim, hi, thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for joining us. I really enjoyed your lecture. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to see the, the scale of this uh, CFAGES program you have in place. Now, we have about 10 minutes or so for questions. So I thought we'd delve backwards and go into a bit of history to begin. So where did this all come from? So, so the CFAGES program, which is the largest and the broadest uh, uh, of the programs that I described, is really a descendant of this a program called FIRE, which stands for Phage Hunters Integrating Research and Education, that we started back in 2002. But I think it's instructive to think about what, what the motivations were for doing that. It wasn't just that we were interested in finding ways and new ways for students to get engaged in doing science, although that's definitely an interest of ours, but we simply had a desire to get more phages so that we could extend and expand what we knew about phage genomics. And, and so it was really that, that dual um, motivation from a research question, as well as uh, an educational mission, which, which really uh, sort of moved it forward. I think it's a general lesson there. People that are interested in developing these kinds of integrated research education approaches it's really helpful, I, I think, to bear in mind that often it's the research questions which really sort of embody the idea of sustainability and the motivation for continuing in the, in the, in the longer term. That makes sense. Drive it forward with the research, of course. Absolutely. So now there's been so many people through the system. Do you get approached in your labs or in your lectures by people who say, well, I did this five years ago and you're the reason I'm here? Well, I, I, I do hear that quite a lot, actually, and, and uh, um, not always from students, but, but I know that uh, in talking to colleagues at other institutions, especially in the US, but elsewhere as well, um, that when they get applicants of students for graduate programs, for example, it's very common for students to have uh, in their application to say that they've been through the CFAGES program and that, you know, they sort of reflect that this was a uh, um, an experience which really got them uh, motivated to do science and then to progress through to graduate uh, as an undergraduate in science and then and then go on to uh, on, on to graduate school. So so we hear it from several different sources, but um, uh, it's 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 clear that although this might not be a program that inspires all students, 
uh, it has the capacity to inspire many, including those who may not have otherwise had opportunities to, uh, to be a scientist. Now, now the programme in a linear fashion involves so many multiple steps. And um, what bottlenecks are there that still exist between isolating a phage and getting it into the collection and sequencing the genome? Yeah, I think that um, for the most part, the phage isolation is relatively um, sort of reproducible and straightforward. Um, it depends on what bacterial host you use for the isolation. Um, some are easier to use and, and um, yield more phages than others do. Um, and we're constantly trying to introduce new bacterial strains and new bacterial hosts. Um, and so figuring out which ones work best and then rolling them out with, you know, uh, adjustments to protocols and things is something that we're kind of mindful of. It's, it's also true that, you know, we don't... Um, we could sequence more of the phages than, than we do. We sort of calibrate the number of genomes that get sequenced to the capacities of the classroom settings for doing the detailed genome annotations. There's a lot of information students have to kind of pick up and learn and to apply. Um, and it's, it's typically just not uh, feasible from an instructor point of view to have you know, 20 students all isolate, all um, annotating 20 different genomes with their various um, foibles and, and special cases that arise. And so um, that's the, the instruction of the bioinformatics and the genome annotation in all of its detail is something that we're constantly working on. And, and we've made progress, I think. And so we're now a classroom of students at any one institution may be, seek, may be annotating several genomes as opposed to one. But we clearly have not yet got to a point where it is sufficiently streamlined that we can sequence and have students annotate every phage that they identify and isolate. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned using different strains. I, I was wondering, are there any other kinds of bacteria you might put on your hit list for making collections of phages against them? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. There's, I mean, there's lots of bacteria and lots of strains, um, so lots to choose from. Um, and um, we, we, what we have done is we have not used a scattershot approach of, you know, a bacillus here and E. coli there and a mycobacterium there, but rather we focused on bacterial hosts within the phylum of the actinobacteria. So instead of, as well as mycobacteria, you know, streptomyces, microbacterium, gordonia, etc. The idea being that that provides a coherence that we hope to see reflected in the phages and therefore to learn about how the phages have evolved by moving from one host to another uh, in this sort of broader picture. And so uh, we very much want to focus on, on, on bacterial strains within the um, actinobacteria. I think one of the things we want to do specifically is try to pull up many more of the non-pathogenic mycobacteria um, pulling from them more broadly, because we think that we'll isolate more phages, which will not only expand what we know about the diversity, but may be useful um, uh, from a, a therapeutic point of view as well. Hmm. And it's good that you bring that up, because I thought maybe we should touch on phage therapy, um, because obviously you had uh, this wonderful success a couple of years ago at Great Ormond Street. And um, I guess what steps are still needed to turn phage therapy into a more mainstream practice? So it's, it's a good question. I mean, this is a topic people have been talking about and debating for 100 years or more, right? Uh, and, and still, the, uh, it's, it's proven a difficult nut to crack. I think, I think there's sort of a couple of major issues I would point to. The first is, is that, you know, specificity is a double-edged sword. The fact that phages are so specific for their, for their bacterial strain, in fact, makes them wonderful as sort of targeted therapies to go in without, you know, take out a pathogen without removing the rest of the microbiome. So the specificity is very good on that perspective. But on the other hand, um, the specificity can mean that a particular phage may only infect a small subset of the clinical isolates of any particular bacterial pathogen. And so breaking that issue down and, and getting phages with the br broadest host range, ranges as possible and, and, um, 
and, or, or panels and cocktails of phages so that you can overcome that specificity issue. That, that, that I think is really one of the key issues. And, and then the second is just um, a lot of the work that we and others have done have been interventions on, on a compassionate use basis. Um, and these case studies are very informative um, but it's not science. It it's, doesn't provide you variables to 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 vary uh, and parameters to understand dosage regimens, etc. Um, and so clinical trials are desperately needed. And it's really getting from here to clinical trials, uh, which is really going to uh, sort of break the back of this. If we can get to clinical trials and understand and pin down uh, the parameters uh, that contribute or, or provide opportunities or limitations, uh, we'll be making some steps forward. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any methods you can see on the horizon? I'm thinking of AI or anything like that that can help us match phages from collections to the pathogen causing the infection. There's been a, a, a lot of interest in it. And, you know, the idea that if you have genome sequence information for a large number of bacterial hosts and, and for a large set of phages, and if you have some training sets so that you can, you can have an artificial system, artificial intelligence system to learn about the specificities. I think that would be really terrific. And so I think that's a very valuable approach to pursue. Um, one word of caution that for me is, is that I think that the numbers of defense mechanisms and the counter defense systems that phages have is probably really large. And the larger that is, the larger those parameters are, the larger the data sets that you need in order to really to have a you know make reliable uh, predictions on an AI kind of basis, and so um, those databases are expanding quickly. And the question is how large they have to be, and when will we get there uh, so that we can address those kinds of questions? I think at the moment it's still uh, specificity needs to be evaluated for most pathogens by demonstrating that the phage actually infects that strain, because in many cases it's just really hard to predict with the current data sets. That we have. That makes sense. Thank you. And I guess, how do you see CFAGES expanding in the near future, long term? And how, and also someone was asking, how, how is this funded as a program? So the, so, so the CFAGES program has been funded by the How to Use Medical Institute. So they provide some support for my, for my lab in order to provide the support functions that I've described. And they also have, um, you know, a couple of staff people that work at HHMI that help to support the program as part of their duties as well. So there's significant support that goes into that. Um, however, you know, the total number of students that have been through the program is probably something like 40,000, right? And so um, the cost per student is actually really, really low once you can get to scale. And I think that, you know, in terms of thinking about how you broaden this to other types of programs, um, you know, other types of implementations, other disciplines. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of figuring out how to most effectively use the investment into supporting the programs from the science and then having the ability to be able to distribute it broadly. Um, so you know, moving forward, um, there's definitely the capacity to add more institutions to decentralize uh, part of the operation once it gets really large. Maybe you don't have a single programmatic uh, sort of infrastructure that I described, but you have substructures that perhaps, you know, support uh, phage discovery programs in a geographical area, maybe, you know, in Africa or Asia or Europe or whatever, however you just decide to break it down. At, at some point, um, the scale is going to become, uh, is going to require some adjustment in terms of its programmatic infrastructure and operations. On the other hand, I think that's all, uh, those are adjustments that are well plausible and possible. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Graham. Um, we, I think we've actually run out of time for all the questions. I'm sure there's lots more coming in. So sorry if we can't answer all the questions that are, are coming. Um, I have a couple of um, small short announcements just to finish off. The recording of the session will be available on the virtual event platform from the 5th of May uh, for a period of one month. And then coming up next, there are five poster sessions to choose from which will start at 6.30, i.e. in 15 minutes. Uh, please make your way back to the platform to select the session you wish to attend. Okay, final thank you very much to Graham Hapful. Uh, thank you to everyone for attending the session and listening through to the questions and answers. And I wish you a pleasant evening, pleasant day, wherever you are. Thanks, Tim. <laughs>